In this video, I'd like to show you how easy it is to replace the radiator on a 2004 Camry. To have a shop do this job for you, you're looking between $700 and $900. And according to the internet, the lifespan of a radiator is between 7 and 10 years. Since my Camry is 18 years old, I want to tell Toyota, good job. This is the first time I've replaced the radiator. The reason why I knew this was bad is because I had to keep on topping off my radiator fluid. There was never a puddle. It was leaking through this top seam here and evaporating. The bad part is you can't see this seam normally. You have to use an inspection mirror to look at it. While shopping for the new radiator, I seem to have had two choices. One of them had a core that was 5 eighths of an inch thick, and the other had a 1 inch thick core. Not knowing exactly which one I needed, I turned to the well-trained experts on the internet. The group vote said the thicker the core, the better the radiator. I purchased the radiator at AutoZone. The part number was Charlie 2436. When I got it out of the box, it appears to be an exact replacement for the original part. The new one is on the left-hand side. While you're at the auto parts store, don't forget to buy new radiator fluid. The package says this is for a Toyota. And if the radiator fluid you bought is a concentrate, like I got, you want to buy some distilled water to mix it with. And as a bonus, don't forget to pick some of this stuff up. Since you're disconnecting your battery, you might as well properly treat it when you put it back together. When we put it on the terminal posts of the battery, it'll improve your electrical conductivity, as well as seal and protect your terminal post connectors. Here's a quick overview on what's going to be involved in this job. We'll have to remove the following parts from the car. The radiator cap. The overflow hose going to the overflow reservoir. The battery and the battery tray. The air scoop going to the air cleaner. The engine fan assembly. Oh yeah, let's not forget the radiator has to come out as well. The following parts will have to be loosened on the car. Remove these two bolts to loosen this metal bracket located below the battery. The hood latch has to be loosened so that you can loosen this entire metal support structure. This is what's actually holding both the radiator and the fan in place. Let's get started. First, remove the battery. Loosen the bolt on the side of the terminals. The terminal will lift right up. Your car probably won't have all these extra wires you see here. I've installed a lot of extra fun stuff on my car. Then you want to remove this bracket here. It's what's holding the battery into the car. Once the bracket is out of the way, you're ready to remove the battery. The battery is pretty heavy, so you might want to consider hitting the gym before you try to pull this out. Now you can remove the battery tray. It's just sitting in there. Since my expertise is in electrical, let me take a real quick side trip. Now would be the perfect time to throw a multimeter onto this battery and check its voltage. Many people would be surprised to know that a 12 volt battery should actually measure 12.6 to 12.8 volts when it's fully charged. As the battery ages, it can't hold a full charge. For example, if you measure 12.2 to 12.4 volts, you know your battery is about half dead. If you only measure 11.8 to 12 volts on your 12 volt battery, it's considered discharged. It probably should be replaced. Or you can take the other route. Let the AAA guy replace your battery when he has to come out to the middle of Wyoming to give you a jump start. If you want to learn more about this weird battery stuff, might I suggest my playlist of videos I made about 12 volt batteries. Click the link above to get started. All right, back to changing the radiator. Remove these two bolts on this support bracket. This is so that you can move that bracket around while you're trying to remove that air scoop that's mounted directly below it. It's that black thing you see in the video. Next, let's remove the air intake duct. Remove these two bolts. Let's see if I can give you an idea what we're dealing with here. The top part is the intake that you just removed the bolts from. On the left is where the air scoop goes into the air filter. It's a tight friction fit into that piece of plastic. And on the bottom right, it hooks up to a tank of some sort. I think it's for collecting water. That white tank fits into your air scoop. So basically you have to pry all this stuff loose. It's all friction fit. And I'll be honest, it wasn't easy getting it out. It actually took me about 20 minutes to break this thing loose.
But through the magic of television, I can show it to you in about 30 seconds. Just for clarification, this is what your tank looks like. And this is where the air scoop goes into the air filter. Now we can drain the radiator and empty the overflow reservoir. However, let's throw a quick caveat in here. Now that I know how extraordinarily long it takes a radiator to drain, I would actually make this the first step if I'm going to do another radiator. Remove the radiator cap. Once it's off, make sure you inspect the seal on the cap. After all, it's got to hold back 10 to 15 pounds of pressure, and in my case, it's 18 years old. On the bottom of the radiator, you'll see this little nipple with a valve on it. You'll open this valve to drain the fluid. On my car, the valve was white. Initially, I was going to remove the air dams on the bottom of the car to drain the fluid. Then I noticed they actually put a hole in the air dam so the fluid could drain out of that little hole. Thank you very much, Toyota. Just reach down in front of the radiator and give that valve a couple turns. The fluid will start draining. Of course, probably a good idea to put a container underneath to catch the fluid. After about two hours, this is what it looked like. While I was waiting for it to drain, I went to the Haynes manual to try to figure out how much fluid I need to put back in it. The manual had these weird random numbers indicating engine size. They mean absolutely nothing to me. So I did some looking around. I actually found that mystical number on the engine emissions control sticker. Which I now know means I need 6.2 quarts of fluid to replace the old stuff. This does not include the overflow reservoir. I want to change as much fluid as possible, so... Remove the overflow hose and drain it. Then remove the hose and cap. Steal your wife's turkey baster and drain the overflow tank. Since antifreeze is poisonous, you probably want to get her a new turkey baster after you're done. Radiator fluid does need to be dropped off at a hazardous waste disposal site. Since no sane person would enter the city of Seattle, the nearest drop-off site for me was about 25 miles away. But hey, we got rid of a lot of other household stuff that we've been hanging on to anyway. Trip well worth it. Now is a good time to unbolt the fans. First, disconnect the top hose from the radiator and just fold it back out of the way. The fan is held in by these three bolts. Remove those bolts. This will loosen the top of the fan, but you can't remove it yet until you get the electrical out of the way. Next, we're going to unbolt the top radiator support. This piece of steel here is what actually holds the radiator in place. These rubber grommets actually hold a pin on the radiator. Likewise, there's grommets on the bottom of the radiator. So in reality, the radiator is just floating. There's not actually anything bolted directly to it. I would imagine this increases the radiator flexibility and prevents leaks. We're going to start out by removing these four bolts. Then you'll find out it still won't come up. Loosen the hood latch. After some investigation, I found out the hood latch is what's actually holding this bracket in place now. For some reason, they placed a bolt right here. The only way I could get it out is with a wrench. Quarter turn at a time. Shame on you, Toyota. Nope, still won't move. Next, I'm going to remove the other two bolts that hold this thing into place. First, I use a sharpie to mark where this was mounted so I can make sure I put it back in exactly the right place. I really do want it to line up with the hood again. Okay, it still won't budge. What gives? As it turns out, this little plastic strap is holding it in place. Since a lot of other stuff on this car just seems to pop out when it's a piece of plastic, I tried prying on it. Didn't have any luck. Did manage to break the other side, though. This is the back side of that strap. It's a very substantial clip. I used some pliers to reach around the back, squeeze the clip, release it, and the plastic strap just came right out.
removing the fan. There are two fan connectors on the driver's side that need to be disconnected. You should now be able to pull the fan straight up. We need to remove the horn wiring. Well, remove's a bad word. Let's say disconnect. Move the radiator support bracket out of the way. And you'll see this wire bundle going across the top of the radiator. Reach down behind the hood latch, squeeze, and pull. Our next problem is this little clamp point right here. That clamp point's actually mounted on the radiator. And, as you can see in this mirror, it's a pretty heavy-duty clip. Use a pair of pliers, give it a little squeeze, and it'll pop right off. You're finished with the top of the radiator, now we can move to the bottom. Disconnecting the bottom of the radiator. There are three separate hoses to disconnect. In case you're wondering why we removed the fan, well it was so you can get access to this stuff. Here I ran into a problem. Accessing these hose clamps to remove them has to be done from the bottom. I'm guessing because the factory put them in from the bottom. Remember, we don't want to remove all those air dams, so there is a solution. Instead, remove the end of the hoses that attaches to the engine. Then you can transfer the hoses over to the new radiator on your workbench. I started with the bottom radiator hose. Use pliers to remove the hose clamp. Then work the hose off of the engine. Now for the transmission lines. Instead of grabbing these two clamps, which are unaccessible, move up the hose and pull these two off. Since they do have transmission fluid in them, I didn't want to make a mess. So I had a cup handy so I could drain the fluid out of it once I disconnected. I then put bags over everything to keep anything from dripping out. This is how much fluid I actually wound up removing. We finally get to the point where we can remove the radiator. Pull straight up. Keep an eye on all your hoses. Make sure they don't get caught on stuff. On the bottom of the radiator on each side is a little nipple pointing straight down. You may see a rubber mounting grommet attached to them when you pull the radiator out. Or the grommet could have stayed with the car. It's simply friction fit. Either way, remove the grommet from the radiator and put it back on the car, where it belongs. One on each side. Now remove the three hoses off the old radiator on the right and install them on the new radiator on the left. While you're moving the hoses, it's probably a good idea to put a protective piece of cardboard over the radiator. You don't want to damage any of the cooling fins while you're moving them. You're ready to slide the radiator back into the car. Being careful of the fins, of course. Slide those two nipples on the bottom of the radiator into those two grommets. Temporarily put the top bracket on to hold everything in place. Remember, the nipples on the top of the radiator go into these two rubber grommets. Hook up your transmission lines to the engine. and install your bottom hose. It's time to put the fan back in. On the bottom of the radiator you'll see these little T-tabs. The bottom of the fan will rest on these T-tabs. Just slide it into place. You can now route your horn wiring. Don't forget to reinstall that clamp point on top of the radiator. The moment we've all been waiting for, we can finally finish installing that top support bracket. Reinstall your four mounting bolts.
Reinstall the top hose. Reinstall the three mounting bolts in the top of the fan. Hook up the two electrical connectors. Installing the air scoop. We all remember this picture. It's friction fit, just get it in place and push. Oh yeah, and hope for the best. I put the air cleaner side in first, then the one on the bottom for the water tank. Once those are in place, reinstall the two mounting bolts on the inlet scoop. Finally, put those two bolts back in for that air filter box bracket. Ignore the fact that the battery's installed in this section. I wound up doing some rework as I figured out the best way to put this back together. And I presented the best way in this video. Speaking of the battery, let's put that back in. I noticed there was some corrosion on that bracket. You want to clean up any corrosion you find before you install the battery. And before somebody leaves a comment, yes, I did blow out all that corrosive dust with shop air. I did not leave it in the car. Put your battery tray in. Put your battery in backwards and then wonder why your cables won't reach. Pull the battery back out, turn it around, and reinstall it facing the correct direction. Reinstall the battery support bracket. We can now hook the battery up. First thing we want to make sure we do. Clean the battery terminal posts as well as the cable clamps that go on them. Apply your conductive spray to the terminals. Now you can mount and install your cable clamps. Let's mix up a new batch of antifreeze. We want to take our antifreeze concentrate and mix it 50-50 with distilled water. To do this, let's dump half of the distilled water into another container. Then top off your distilled water container with your antifreeze concentrate. Please make sure you mark this bottle so nobody thinks it's Kool-Aid. Let's fill up the radiator in the overflow reservoir. After your overflow reservoir is at the appropriate level, reinstall your overflow hose. Put your radiator cap back on. This one's really easy to forget. Remember, we lost some transmission fluid during this process. It would not be a good idea to pour this back into the transmission. It's in a paper cup. Paper fibers would get into your transmission. I'm no expert, but I'm guessing that's not very good for your transmission. In addition to what's in this cup, I have no idea how much was in the radiator. So start your car up, get it up to operating temperature, and check your fluid level. The fluid should fall between these two marks. If you're too low, get a funnel and top it off through your dipstick tube. You should not require very much. Hooking up the hood latch. Install the stupid bolt behind the latch. Once again, thank you, Toyota. Push the two plastic clips into place. The two side bolts. It's time to carefully test it and see if your hood will actually latch into place.
Well, there you have it. We've come to the end of this journey. You've saved yourself seven to nine hundred dollars, and your Camry will be running like a top for at least seven to ten years. Thanks for watching.